in addition to things mm. such as progress and modernity, which mm. you've spoken about, mm. you also want to present a serious challenge to other mm. cherished ideas and ideals, such as our notion of morality mm. as a guide to our actions, mm. our sense of self, mm. our sense of, of free will, mm. and so on. So there are, there are, there are some very mm. thoroughgoing challenges mm. going on beyond the sort of grand ideological level mm. as to how we actually think about ourselves. Well, one goal of um, Straw Dogs is to bring our way of thinking about ourselves closer to the way we actually experience ourselves. Because there's a, a, a strong tendency in Western thought, I would say in all human thought, but it can, I know the West, Western thinking better, and maybe it's even more accentuated in certain respects in Western thought than in other types of thought, to um, develop conceptions of humans' self-consciousness, human freedom of action, human agency, which really, and take those conceptions as being in a sense descriptive of the way we are, when they're really highly idealized and um, almost hyperbolic uh, developments of how we would like to be. So I think it's a kind of commonplace experience that over a complete lifetime at any rate, and even sometimes in shorter life, shorter periods of a lifetime, people find themselves having not only conflicting impulses, but not having the kind of highly fixed set um, identity that their religious and philosophical tradition says that all human beings have. I mean, it's false to experience. And of course, a lot of modern art, a lot of modern literature has challenged this uh, self-image, this inherited self-image in which we are highly cohesive, coherent agents, authors of our lives, implementing them step by step and so forth. But philosophy oh, and um, more abstract types of thinking outside of the arts, I think has tended still to operate with these images. We talk about wanting to be autonomous, which means, um, as it were, inscribing our lives with our intentions, when we all know that much of our lives are the products of chance or involuntary experience, or of on the more positive side, creativity which or, cre or decisions which turn out to be wonderful decisions and to be very fruitful in our lives, which at the time we can't explain or maybe never explain. So um, it's intended to correct this highly idealized self-image, not in order to flatten um, our experience of ourselves or to flatten our hopes, but to actually see how so much of our lives, including their most creative aspects and phases are products of what might be called animal sagacity rather than of the sort of self-reflective autonomous decision making which we like to imagine that we have and which we so rarely have and which we might be better off not having more of. Certainly we'd be better off not being wholly like that because if so much of our creativity comes from mental life, kind of organic life which is not conscious and cannot be conscious in many cases, then we would impoverish ourselves by getting closer to that ideal. So in a sense, it's a, it's a, it's a criticism of um, ideals, human ideals. Human ideals are sort of commonly thought to be terribly good things. I don't think they are that uh, good. I think that they have, and what's bad about them is not that they can't be achieved. If they could achieve them, the world would be much poorer than it is. It's that the ideals themselves are too one-sided and leave out too much and don't understand enough about the way we like other animals. And of course, one of the, one of the core uh, ideas of the book is that although we differ from human animals and from other animals in important respects, we've had much greater evolutionary success. Unlike any other that we know, we do philosophize about ourselves and um, we don't know that dolphins do, for example, we might be unique on this planet and having these capacities and um, tastes for self-reflection and so on. But we do remain an animal. We're animals, not like animals. We are animals, just are. And that's part, a large part of our, the animal status that we have, our standing as animals, not something that we should strive desperately to shake off or transcend. It's something from which our most, much of our creativity, even 
comes, even the creativity which is expressed in forms of activity which no other animal can emulate, mm. that creativity very often comes from our animal inheritance, then passed through the filter or passed through the activities that other animals um, don't have. And, and so uh, it's really wanted to reclaim that animal in inheritance as something valuable. You talk about distinguishing between the untruths mm. we can jettison mm. and those untruths which we yeah. need in order to yeah. Yeah. to exist. Mm. That, and then that that seemed to me quite an interesting the way crucial, to the to um, the way to sort of pursue the, the yeah. themes of the book. Yes, I mean, do we need a conception of free will in order to, for example, do we need an illusion of free will in order? Now, many people would say we do. Uh, we can't. Remember. Perhaps we do. Did Plato have a conception of free will, or the people? In Plato's time, did they have, or Homer's time, did uh, the Buddha have a conception of free will? It might be quite a parochial conception, at least the, 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 the intense preoccupation with questions of free will. I mean, there are glimmerings of interest in it in ancient Greece with, and Rome, with writers like Epicurus talking about atoms swerving and so the world's not wholly determined and fixed and so on. But I think that the, 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 the intense, almost obsessional preoccupation with free will is more distinctively part of late Christian and post-Christian civilization. So I, I think we could do without an idea of free will. I mean, we might feel that we're acting when on a, another view we're not acting. But as I say in the book, it may turn out that free will is just a trick of perspective. It's how we look at ourselves and how we ex experience it. But still, there will be what I call illusions in the book, or which could all alternatively be called myths. There might well be, and I think there will be, myths we can't do without. And then the question is, which myths can which people not do without? And they might not all be the same myths. They might differ uh, between and within cultures and civilizations, and maybe conceivably within between people, and even conceivably within a single person's lifetime. It's kind of very interesting, interesting question. Well, I mean, I think one idea that the book certainly wants to question and does question is the idea that a whole civilization or even a single person can exorcise illusion or mythic thinking from their minds entirely. That is, seems to me, to be an illusion or a myth. Uh, it's, it's Whenever it's attempted, it produces bizarre results because typically what happens is that the the beliefs connected with the myth or the illusion might get rejected or inverted or negated. But the pattern of the myth is renewed in Freud, the return of the repressed, but in some other form. And so you might say, I completely, some people would say they completely reject the idea of divine providence working throughout history. But then when you look at their thinking, if they're Marxists or certain types of um, liberals, uh, um, what they'll see is human history moving through a variety of um, phases everywhere in the world and as being a single enterprise history is a kind of a single enterprise and it's an enterprise not of god but in now in that case of humankind but if you really think of humans in a naturalistic manner and that's to say as animals like other animals we don't think of tigers as all having a single tigerish enterprise which they pursue in their different ways or uh, gorillas as it were gradually working out the telos of gorilladom that's to say they're going all kind of some kind of ideal hen ideal gorilla they're all working towards they each live their own lives and they have various cultures and communities we now re 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 we now understand they also have types of ethics they care for each other and they um, uh, have sympathy and so forth but they they they, they aren't a kind of um, uh, an agent acting in the world. So that although Marxists and some liberals and progressive thinkers very often reject providentialist religious beliefs in divine providence, as they reject the beliefs, the category of thinking, the way of thinking about human history recurs, re renews itself, returns uh, as the idea of history as a, a single continuous enterprise, which in my view definitely is not 